Well, good morning. Let's, uh, let's open our time together in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for even the mundane things. We thank you that even our civil magistrates recognize this as a holiday still. We thank you that this is a day that we can come, we can gather as your people. And it is not the Lord's day, it is not a Sunday, but it is the day we get to spend thinking specifically of your death, your atonement, your willing sacrifice for hell-bound sinners to redeem us, to bring us to yourself to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And as we consider the greatest sin ever perpetrated on this earth, we also consider the greatest display of your holiness, of your love, of your mercy, of your justice, of your wrath, and of your forgiveness. Forgiveness that we experience, forgiveness that we know. So help us to worship in light of that this morning. And as we turn to your word, and consider the horrific and blessed events of that day. We ask, Lord, that it would change us, that it would motivate us to spur us on to worship and praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the more striking images that you are no doubt familiar with is rows upon rows of white crosses or gravestones. And no doubt you've seen pictures of row upon row of cross after cross through a cemetery, and you are struck with image of gravestone after gravestone lined up. When someone dies, we recognize that something has gone wrong. There's something intuitive about that. We, of course, know that we are created in the image of God, and death is not natural. And there's something natural about recognizing that death is unnatural. And so when people die, we try to hold on to something of them. And gravestones are a common way to do this. We erect a gravestone and it serves as a reminder of that person and their life. And we typically honor the dead. And this is especially true when a well-known or famous person dies. We will name schools or streets after them and it is a desire to remember them. And generally speaking, the more impactful your life was, the more known you were, the greater the effort is in trying to remember you. And while we can think of a great many schools, roads, and even cities named after people who have passed on, I don't know of any dead person who has been remembered by naming a people after them. When John F. Kennedy was assassinated, they renamed the space center and the airport after him. But I do not know of a group of people called the Kennedyites. Ronald Reagan is honored, and rightly so, but I've never met the man who willingly calls himself a Reaganite. And yet there are millions of people who will take the title of Christian, of little Christ. And there are many people who have faced death before they were willing to give up that name, that title for themselves. And that is fitting because there has never been a more significant person who has ever lived than Jesus Christ. There was no more significant death than the death of our Lord. There was no greater act of sin ever enacted on planet Earth that exceeds the evil of the murder of the Son of God. There is no greater display of love and mercy and compassion than the death of Jesus Christ. For most modern civilizations, even our dating system revolves around what happened when Christ died. Even in recent attempts to rid ourselves of the language of Christ, the crucible between the common era and the before common era is still that time when Christ died. What happened to that Jewish carpenter named Jesus? The image we most commonly associate with Christianity comes, of course, from the death of Christ. That old symbol of torture, execution, and death associated with criminals and terrorists has become the world's best-known symbol of hope and life. And that is why on many gravestones you will see a cross. Perhaps the gravestone itself is a cross. The greatest instrument of death has become the greatest image 
of life. The cross is absolutely central to our theology. There are two things that separate Christianity from every other world religion. And the first one is that only Christianity has a cross. Only Christianity has a cross. Only Christianity speaks of a theology of a finished work, an atonement for sin. And Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, note that he did not come to them with lofty speech or with wisdom, with ingenuity. He did not come to them with incredible oratorical displays or cunning wit. He didn't come to them with riddles and mysteries. He says, when I came to you, brothers, did I not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God? Not with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he says this, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and in my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration in spirit, in the spirit and of power. And he says this, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that is a fascinating statement by the apostle. Notice what he is doing. On the one hand, he is diminishing his ability. In, in reality, Paul was an incredible thinker, one of the best of his day. And he was seen that way in Judaism even before his conversion to Christ. He was brilliant. This is the young man who comes up with two PhDs before he's 21. And not only that, but he had the opportunity to learn from some of the world's best. And Paul, after his conversion, was a supremely gifted church planter, missionary, preacher, and theologian. And yet, in the final analysis, he reminds the Corinthians that the power behind his message has nothing to do with himself. The force behind his ministry is not him, but he looks to the cross. It wasn't in his skill or his talent or his gifts or his determination. It is in the fact that his Savior died. He came in power, just not his own. The power of God. And he further defines that power by saying, He determined to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. In other words, other teachers, other religions, other people are coming to you, and they're coming with the message that they alone have the secret to eternal life. The mysteries of the universe are, are figured out. They come to you, and what wins you over is their personality, their intellect, their, their likability, their success as a salesman. And Paul says Christianity is fundamentally different. Because the only thing that matters is Christ and Him crucified. A Savior who died on behalf of His children. The power of Christianity is in the message itself, not the messenger. It entirely lies without human cunning or a winnable personality, but in the power of the cross. What happened on Good Friday? And Paul is obviously using a figure of speech known as a hyperbole. It's an intentional exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. And that is what Paul is doing. And he's clearly emphasizing that no matter what his ministry entailed, no matter what he is talking about or doing, when you zoom out and you evaluate the Apostle Paul, he says, do not forget the cross. Everything I do comes down to the cross of Christ. It comes back to the cross. And that is how it is for every Christian. Everything comes down to the cross. And that means as we gather for worship on Good Friday, we are truly approaching holy ground. When we consider the cross where our sinless Savior died, when we consider Golgotha, the murder of not only an innocent man, but the God-man by godless men, we are coming to the very hub of what makes Christianity distinctly Christian. Only we know something of a perfect atonement on our behalf. You might forget certain things that we teach. There might be doctrines that you haven't even heard of, let alone studied. You might forget certain things that we say. Do not ever forget the centrality of the cross. 
Do not ever forget the message of Christ crucified. And so with our time this morning, I want to do two things. I want to look at the historical account of what happened on Good Friday. Now, we don't actually know for certain that Christ died on a Friday. Both Wednesday and Thursday are possibilities. Nonetheless, we do have a good biblical picture of what happened. So I want to look at what happened historically, and then I want to look at what happened theologically. What happened historically, and, and what happened theologically? What happened on the cross? Well, let me first give you some, some of the historical accounts. The, the events of that day would have begun with the Sanhedrin meeting. It's interesting that the, the day central to everything we believe begins with the enemies of Christ. And the Sanhedrin would have met early in the morning in the house of Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time. And the Sanhedrin was the ruling council. And, and they were in charge of Jewish affairs in Roman-occupied Palestine. And they were teachers and priests, and they would have met to determine legal matters. And legal matters specifically that had political or social ramifications. And so this would have been a formal government meeting, essentially. And they had met the previous evening... And now we're meeting again in the morning. And the primary emphasis of the Sanhedrin gathering was not on a matter of Christ's guilt. That would have been illegally determined the night before. This meeting on the first morning of Good Friday would have been more procedural and, and probably about a course of action. What are we going to do and what specific charge are we going to bring? They had already decided they needed Christ dead. In John 18, Pilate asks them, what charge are you bringing? And then they essentially try to evade making a charge at all. And they, they say, if he was not guilty, would we have bring you? Would we have brought him to you? And they had determined to hand over Jesus to Pilate, but they couldn't agree. They couldn't find a charge that would satisfy the Jews and Rome. And one of the difficulties of trying to judicially murder a man who committed no sin is come up with a charge that's going to work that's going to stick and in the end Pilate forces their hand he forces them to come up with a charge and he says they they accuse him of essentially being a political dissident they say he's, he's instructing people to stop giving money to Caesar and so the Jews who bring Jesus to Pilate and Pilate would have been in Jerusalem at this time he was probably staying at the Herodian temple and amazingly, the Sanhedrin, as they bring Jesus to Pilate, do not go in the temple. They don't go into the place where Pilate is because to go into a Gentile dwelling would be to defile themselves. And it being Passover, they would not want to defile themselves so that they might eat the Passover meal that evening. It is incredible that they were morally scrupulous enough to avoid going into a, a dwelling of a Gentile leader, the Roman temple, but not so scrupulous that they decided not to murder an innocent man who just happened to be the Messiah of God. And so they come, and Pilate asks them what accusation they have against him. What reason are you bringing this man for justice, for Roman justice? And the Sanhedrin are almost put off by the question. They seem startled. In reality, Pilate was probably put off by the fact that they were even there. It was a trial held secretly, privately, and overnight, none of which were allowed in Jewish law or custom. And, and even more than that, Rome insisted on public trials. Pilate, in reality, wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Pilate didn't see Jesus as guilty of anything. And the Jews couldn't bring a formal charge that made any sense. And Pilate's own wife was telling him, have nothing to do with this man, Jesus. But Pilate did take the case. And of course, you'll remember, Pilate speaks to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't respond except to say that any power Pilate has has been given to him from God. And Pilate is in a bit of a bind. Uh, Pilate is in a tough spot because the Jews clearly want Jesus dead. But Pilate can't justify the trial or find a coherent charge or establish guilt of anything meaningful or anything specific. On the other hand, politics at this time was naturally unstable. 
Uh, Pilate was routinely in danger of having Rome come by and swoop in and remove him from the district, district of Judea. And Pilate was always in danger of losing his position and losing his power. And so he was anxious to not create too much controversy. And he feared that if he didn't convict and accuse Jesus, sentence Jesus, then the Jews would riot. And that would cost him politically. And, he, and if he couldn't suppress and quell the rebellion, then Rome would come in. And there had been Jewish rebellions in the past. And, and the Jews didn't always appreciate Roman rule. And so there was an instability about the time. It was a volatile and unstable situation. And now, probably for the first time that Pilate has ever seen or even heard of, the Jews are all in agreement. The Sadducees and the Pharisees agreed on almost nothing, except that Christ must die, that this man Jesus must die. They are fully united in their desire to see Christ crucified. And so Pilate reasons, if all of them want Christ dead, this might be a sizable revolt. And it might cost Pilate his life, if not his position of authority. And so Jesus is handed over to Pilate. And Pilate has him scourged and whipped. Cicero referred to the scourging as the intermediate death because it was so painful. One writer calls it the terrible introduction to crucifixion. And we have records of whippings that were done. And it was done with leather straps. And they would take small pieces of bone, small spikes, and, and they would put them in the end of the leather strap. And it would tear open the back and chest and sometimes even the face. The victim would usually fall down and be unable to get up on his own strength. The victim would have essentially at this point been a bleeding mass of torn flesh. And this is what happened to our Lord. And at this point, Jesus' hands would have been tied. And he would have been forced to walk to the place where the execution itself would be carried out. And, and all of crucifixion was designed to be a spectacle. It was designed not just to kill, not just to torture, but it was, it was common for jesting and mocking and ridicule and spitting. And, and so they would make the accused walk in public. And people would line up on the road. And for Jesus, they mockingly arrayed him in purple because he claimed to be a king. And of course, drove a crown of thorns into his head as further pain and mockery. And as he was walking by, many even pretend mockingly to worship him, pretend to cry out to him. And Pilate again presents Jesus to the crowd, to the Jewish leaders, and they yelled out, crucify him, crucify him. And it's possible at this point that Pilate is again trying to rid his hands of this whole sordid affair. He was hoping that the Jews seeing the pathetic, bruised, bleeding body of an innocent man, even Jesus, would cause the crowd some human level of sympathy, and, and Rome wouldn't have to execute a man they knew was innocent. And Pilate sat down, and he deliberated again, and he stood up and said, Behold your king. And Israel responded, crying out all the more, We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. I mean, put yourself in first century Palestine. That is an unbelievably blasphemous thing to say for a Jew. And with that, Israel completely rejected her Messiah. The die was cast. One Messianic Jewish writer says, With this cry, Judaism was, in the person of its representatives, guilty of denial of God, of blasphemy, of apostasy. It committed suicide, and ever since has its dead body been carried to show, in show from land to land and from century to century to be dead and to remain dead till he come a second time. And Jesus was now sentenced, this coming from Pilate. The hammer, nails, and even food for the soldiers who were to crucify him was prepared. And Christ would have been tied to the wooden crossbeam and forced to carry himself carry it himself and we know that he was too physically weak to do so and a man from the crowd was forced to carry it by now it's probably 9 a.m it's 9 a.m and the procession 
this sham has reached Golgotha. And as Jesus would have been put on the cross, it, it wasn't high. Jesus' feet would have been no more than one, maybe two feet off the ground. But the cross piece would have been laid down and Jesus being tied to it already would have his wrists nailed to it. And then it would be attached to the upright, which would then be pulled by ropes into a hole in the ground. And so the last final moment would be the piece of wood dropping into the ground. His feet would then have been nailed through, probably with one large iron nail that would have gone through both ankles. And the sign that said, King of the Jews, would have been attached. And it's also here that Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this is when the real agony of crucifixion begins. It was a physical and mental torture from this point on. It would take up to three days for your average crucifixion victim to die once they were up on the cross. Weary, unrelieved, unrelenting pain until they died. For our Lord, it didn't take three days because he had something much worse. It was here that the Father poured out his wrath on his Son. It was here that the world went dark. The earth shook. The veil ripped in the temple. And our King bore the full force of the perfect wrath of Almighty God. This is what happened historically. What happened theologically? What happened theologically? What happened when Christ died on the cross? One of the earliest ways to answer that question was that it was a ransom to Satan. And the idea is, is that what happened on the cross was a payment to Satan. The idea was is that Satan had some hold of some people, and so Jesus pays the price to Satan. And there is the moral influence theory. And that is basically the modern liberal view, and it says the cross, the death of Christ, was God's chosen means to manifest his love to show his desire to fellowship with human beings. And it's essentially God saying, this is how much I want to be with you, that I'm willing to die. As similar to the moral influence theory is the example theory. It agrees that what happened on the cross was God's love displayed, but says that this is an example for us. And so the ultimate example for us to live is to sacrifice. None of these even get close to what Scripture says happened on the cross. In fact, if you read works from those perspectives, you'll realize they're more concerned with getting around what the Bible says about the crucifixion than actually explaining it. And so this morning, let me give you the biblical account of what happened on the cross, theologically. And we'll do this in three words. Three words, redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation. Redemption. Redemption. This is what happened on the cross. And the idea of redemption is to buy or to purchase. If you go into a store and you redeem a coupon, you are purchasing something. And the idea was it drew from a common understanding in Jewish law. In Jewish law, it was understood that a property would need to remain within the family. Okay? And so this means that if a Jew lost their property through debt, for example, a close relative could buy, could redeem that plot of land. They would buy it back. And this person was called a kinsman redeemer, Boaz being the most famous example when he redeemed the land that belonged to Ruth's first husband. And of course, with it took Ruth. In the Greek world, where purchasing normally took place was in the market. You would go to the market and you would purchase something out of the market. And now that small word out is very important. If you go to a mall or in ancient times, if you go to the market and you purchase something, you bring it out of the market. It doesn't stay in the store. It doesn't stay in the mall. It is removed from the economy of the marketplace. And so its economic status fundamentally changes when it is purchased. And so we are correct in saying that on the cross, what happened, redemption 
being a spiritual transaction. It's a spiritual purchase in which Christ buys his sheep out of the marketplace of the world, as it were. This is what Paul is getting at in Galatians. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, so we were purchased out of the realm of the law. Where the law curses, we are bought out of it. Revelation chapter 5, we see this word again. It's translated ransom in the ESV, but it speaks of Jesus redeeming a people out of every tongue, tribe, family, and nation. The 24 elders are singing praise to God for purchasing his people, making them to be a kingdom. And incidentally, here we see the proper response to redemption. It is worship and praise to the only one who could and the only one who did, in fact, redeem humanity. And we see evidence of this spiritual transaction in 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says, we were bought with a price. Romans 3.24 says, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.14 says, in who, that's a reference to Christ, we have redemption. And Paul wrote elsewhere, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. There's a second aspect, however, to this idea of redemption. And that is when somebody redeemed a slave. This wasn't simply buying something out of the marketplace, but actually purchasing a person out of the marketplace. And if somebody were to pay the slave price, then they would redeem that slave from their old master, and the slave would become property of the one who paid the price. And so their status was changed, their master was changed. And so this raises an important theological question. What were we slaves to? before we were redeemed by Christ and made slaves of Christ? Well, in a word, sin. In a word, sin. We are held captive by sin. We are under the control of sin. Jesus, you'll remember, said that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. If you practice sin, you are a slave to it. Paul confirms that in Romans 3. When he says that no one is righteous, no, not one. Why? We have sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short. And see, we have to understand that sin is something far worse than some choices we make that are not ideal. Sin is far worse than some less than perfect decisions. Sin is an all-consuming, oppressive, controlling master that holds us captive, destroys our life, and damns us. That is why it is written in Proverbs, the iniquity of the wicked ensnare him. See, sin is a snare, and we are held captive to it. Peter talks about being slaves to corruption, and then he reminds us, whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And Jesus Christ on the cross releases us from the slavery of sin, and makes us slaves of righteousness. And this means that there are only two options for a person. Either you were bought out of the marketplace of sin, you are released from the captivity of sin, and and have embraced becoming a slave of righteousness, a slave of Christ, or you are still in the marketplace of sin where there is curse, and you are a slave to sin. But there is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. The second word that I want to give you this morning is propitiation. Second word that explains what happened on the cross. Propitiation means satisfaction. It it embodies the concept that the the death of Christ on the cross fully satisfies the demands of God's holiness, of his wrath in respect to judgment upon the sinner. It means satisfying or averting God's anger or wrath. Leon Morris writes of God's wrath, quote, There is a consistency about the wrath of God. It is no capricious passion, but the stern reaction of the divine nature to evil in man. 
it is aroused only and inevitably by sin, which may be thought of in general terms or may be categorized more exactly as the shedding of blood, adultery, violence, covetousness, revenge, afflicting widows and orphans, and taking brethren captive, unquote. See, when we look at Scripture, we see that where there is sin, there is divine wrath. And yet we also see that the Bible doesn't have a pagan idea of divine wrath, of, of placating an unreasonable deity. In fact, what we see is that God's wrath is the wrath of a loving father who desires and yearns for his children to come to him. And this is the theological foundation by which Jesus came. And Jesus coming and dying on the cross is God's own provided means of his own satisfaction. It isn't that there is no divine wrath. There most certainly is. But it is the satisfaction of that righteous wrath against sin is provided by God himself through the death of Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. You can contrast that with Revelation 16, where we read that the great city is split into three parts, and the cities fall, and God makes Babylon, that's the city, Babylon the great, drain the cup of the wine of the fury of God's wrath. See, in both cases, there is wrath. But in one case, we avoid wrath because Christ took it. In the other case, sinners receive the wrath of God for their sins. That is why Paul says, whom God put forward, and he's talking about Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Notice that the satisfaction of God's wrath comes through comes by the blood of Jesus. That is the death of Christ to those who would receive it by faith. See, the death of Jesus is the means by which God's wrath against your sin and my sin can be satisfied. And this again leaves mankind with only two possible options. Leon Morris explains again, quote, there seem only two possibilities. Either Christ took my sins and bore their consequences, or he did not take my sins, in which case they are still on me and I bear the consequences. And our third word this morning is reconciliation. Reconciliation. What happened at the cross? Redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation. And when we look at the biblical data on reconciliation, the Bible uses a whole bunch of words that could all be translated or all convey the basic meaning of reconciliation. But the basic idea is pretty simple, and it refers to a state of affairs after estrangement or enmity has been overcome and there is unity again. When unity is restored, that refers, that is reconciliation. And see, there is enmity between God and man because of our sin, because of our rebellion. And Paul writes in Colossians that we were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And to the Romans, he says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Earlier in that letter, he notes that we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, even while we were enemies of God. You see, the basic relationship between God and man is one of hostility. It is one of hostility. It is one of rebellion. It is one of alienation. And yet one of the consequences of the cross is that where there was hostility, there is now unity. Where there was rebellion, there is worship and service. And there are a few basic basic biblical truths regarding reconciliation. The first, reconciliation is something we desperately need and yet have no claim to. We have no right to expect it. We do not deserve reconciliation of the relationship that our sin defiled and polluted. And second, the Bible presents reconciliation of a work of God and God alone. And Paul brings this out in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled to us to himself. 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He continues, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And let me again point out that when it comes to reconciliation, there is only two options. Either you are an enemy of God, you are estranged from God, you are separated from his promises, or you are united to Christ in newness of life, and you are a new creation. You are part of the family of God and recipient to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But dear friends, there are only two types of people in the world. There are those who understand Good Friday, and there are those who don't. There are those who have been redeemed by God and who are willing slaves of Jesus Christ, and there are those who are still slave to their sin. There are those whose sins have been paid for by Christ, and the wrath of God has been satisfied, and there are those who are still under the wrath of God waiting for judgment. There are those who have been reconciled to God and are united to Jesus Christ by faith in him, and there are those who are estranged, alienated, without promises, and without hope. That is why the center of Christian theology is the cross. That is why an ancient instrument of torture has become the world's best-known symbol for hope. Because what person you are comes entirely down to what you do with the cross of Christ. And Christ on the cross suffered for man. He offered himself a sacrifice. He died for our sins, that as death was the wages of sin, so he died as a representative of man. For man and in the room of man, he obtained for man eternal redemption. Having given his life a ransom for many, for men were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. And Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem those under the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. It is this sacrificial, vicarious, propitiatory, redemptive character of Christ's death that explains to us why we come to church on a Friday. This tells us why John 3.16 is one of the most beloved verses in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. He gave his Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we cannot begin to imagine the sinfulness of our sin. We cannot begin to imagine the depths of our own rebellion. We cannot begin to imagine how in sin's clutches we were. And we can't begin to imagine the wrath of your holy justice. And therefore, we can't begin to imagine what happened on Good Friday. But I know this, that there is a group of people who, though they were alienated, are redeemed and reconciled, that there are a group of people, and I stand among them as unworthy, as those whose own sin has offended your holy name, and yet we come into the glories of Christ because of what happened 2,000 years ago. And we cannot begin to understand the pain or the agony because we can only understand forgiveness and redemption. We don't know what it's like to be a slave to sin because we have embraced being a slave to Christ. Amen. I'll now call the worship team forward.